Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our host at PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full-color, full-featured, full-HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dial-ins are from Voxbone.com. And we don't know who's talking. <laughs> so I you know, asked Michael Graves to uh, lead the call because I'm having some weird internet problems. But I did want to introduce um, Mike Oath, who's the CEO of Onsip. And Onsip has been friends with us since the beginning. In fact, I had an, I had an Onsip account when it was Junction and for years when it was Junction. Hello, Mike. Hello. How are you? Everything is good. And I was uh, really pleased to be able to participate, as Michael did, uh, to, with uh, on on some of your blab uh, presentations, yeah. those were a lot of fun. You you guys are doing a great job. Oh, thank you. So thank you. We're we've been together for a while, and Michael and I were just looking at the new interface, and we're going to get into all of that. But before we do, I'll I'll let Michael uh, introduce our topic and everything for today. Okay. Well, I um, I have not. I'm a traditionalist. Uh, being a certain age, I guess, um, and I really like hardware, but you guys have a lot of stuff that's not hardware about what you do, and yeah. so with that, I think I'd just like to let you fill me in on what I don't know, or as as Guy Rizdal would say, make me smart. <laughs> um, so so uh, my ONSIP is going away, and yeah. there's something new, and then there's a Slack thing and how did all this come to pass you know what what brings all this about uh, probably the, the biggest thing was our uh our, our commitment to web rtc so i I'm, I'm sure you and and most of the audience knows but but web rtc was the html5 spec that allows the browser to talk directly to the multimedia of your laptop so Prior to HTML5, if you wanted access to speaker, uh, microphone, uh, video camera, you had to uh, create a Java application. And so the browser would talk to Java, Java would talk to the media, and or Flash, uh, it could be Flash as well. But before any of that would happen, the visitor to the website would have to download uh, this Java code or this Flash code to make that happen. HTML5 came along, uh, game changer, uh, with WebRTC, and WebRTC now gives the browser direct access to the media on your laptop, desktop, whatever, uh, without any software to download. So we, we saw that uh, pretty immediately as a way to make voice and video phone calls uh, directly through a browser. And so we started working pretty much right away uh, on uh, adding SIP as a protocol to WebRTC. So WebRTC, like I said, allows you to have access to the media, but there's nothing specific in WebRTC uh, about the protocol that's used for setting up and tearing down calls and negotiating codecs and all that. Uh, this is in the name. We're pretty good with SIP. So we thought that SIP would be a really great candidate as the call control for WebRTC. So we went about uh, creating a uh, JavaScript library that allows you to use SIP as the uh, communications protocol for WebRTC. Uh, we, we did that, and then we open sourced it. And that's out there as SIP.js. A uh, great open source library, and it allows you to do uh, call setup, call teardown, and that's not too bad uh, if you were going to write that yourself, or either in SIP or some other protocol, or if you wanted to write your own protocol, that's fine. Uh, but 
uh, it, it's when you want to put a call on hold, when you want to transfer a call, make a three-way call. That's when uh, all that communication starts to get really, really tricky. Uh, and all of that is is currently in SIP.js, and, and it's out there, and it's uh, freely available. So it's fun. It's, it's, it's our first. We, we've used a lot of open source in our, in our history. Uh, it's our first uh, open source project that, that we've run, and it's, it, it's been great. Uh, I'm on the mailing list for uh, when, when developers submit questions and, and want new features and so forth. So it's, it's fun to be uh, actively involved in an uh, open source project. Uh, but that was it. So we took what used to be my ONSIP, which is kind of the user uh, interface into the ONSIP uh, platform, and we turned that into what we're calling the ONSIP app or app.onsip.com. And uh, a lot of the same functionality uh, with uh, is that the, the ability to see everybody else in your organization, their current call status, uh, be able to set up calls be between people in your organization and or just dial out to the PSDN. Uh, the ability to receive calls right there in your browser. And then the, the news this week is the Slack integration. Uh, so we had the ability to, to text chat each other from within the ONSIP app. But uh, now you'll have the ability to, uh, uh, for those uh, chats to be mirrored over in, the, in a Slack app or, and actually use the Slack API in those chats. Um, and then over in the, uh, and so that's the integration with the ONSIP app. And then over in Slack, the ability to put in some, uh, a, a couple, uh, starting out with a couple simple slash commands, so slash ONSIP and then status and, and get the status, the, the current operational status of uh, the ONSIP system, things like that. So that's, that's kind of where, uh, briefly, where we moved and, and how and why we moved from, from my ONSIP over to the ONSIP app. And then, you know, we, we wanted to have that chat integration. We, we wanted to build our own chat. And, you know, it, it's hard to be all things to all people. So we, we looked around, best of breed. Uh, Slack had a really nice integration API. Like it, it's, it's gonna be easier to integrate Slack into our app than to go and build a whole uh, chat uh, service ourselves. So we went down that road instead. That's, it's very interesting. Um, what, what, Echo. Echo. Um, what, Percentage of the customer, what kind of uptake do you see on, on the uh, browser-based calling just in general, whether it be the old version or the new version? Is it is it widespread or is it sort of special cases, special verticals? I haven't seen it any in any special verticals, uh, and it's it's. I, I know the uptake in the Onsip app itself has been great. Uh, uh, I am, but I'm I'm not sure whether they're using it just as a uh, a way to see the status of everyone, kind of like a, a, a visual BLF, for example, or if they're actually using it to to call. I know for us internally uh, in in our support department, which is mostly here in in this office, which is the just outside of Philly office, um, we've kind of switched over to using that as opposed to the polycom on the on the desk now i still for the most part use the polycom on the desk i like picking up a receiver you know the whole thing uh but most of the people here have usb headsets wireless usb headsets like yours uh, you can get up walk around um mute it uh and that then connected directly to the laptop in between calls switch over to listening to music or whatever it's uh, they here internally, completely voluntarily, they've really switched over to the uh, uh, to the web-based calling. And have you seen with that an accompanying increase in the use of video while calling as well? Mm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other day, uh, I took a sales call, and so we have a we have a button on our website where you can uh, so. Uh, so unlike Skype, so if you, if you and I wanted to have a Skype call or put a, a Skype button, it, both sides have to be Skype users. Um, but we allow one side just to be a, a, a random visitor to the website. The other side has to has to be on onset. So we have a button on our website that uh, you can click and, and video call either into sales or to support. 
great. Uh, the other morning, uh, I had my laptop out and I was doing email. It was a little bit after eight in the morning, and a call came in uh, to the sales side. I'm like, I don't think any sales guys are around. Let me just answer it real quick. And I, I was I was in boxers, <laughs> and a video <laughs> popped up. Like, oh wait, I forgot. <laughs> so I answered it on the web-based phone on my laptop. And uh, but the the other side didn't have video going, so I was able to mute my video, and we had a perfectly fine sales call, and uh, it went really well. But I I'm not in the mentality of uh, oh wait I need to be video ready <laughs> when I when the, I answer these calls. That's really interesting because it's true. And um, in a past gig, I used to travel a lot, go out to customer sites, and was always you know dressed in. Business formal, if you will, business casual, sure. but business yeah. formal. And, and I was sort of joking to myself that uh, since then, though, you know, business casual for me is more like beach casual for some people. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and you're going to do a video call, you know, things like, you know, uh, hair, beard, uh, shaving, right. and all that. You got you to you make. Um, which is, you know, it, it comes interesting when, if you're doing a lot of people working from home and, and uh, you know, the street right. is and stuff like that so um interesting question then uh, this is my first time playing with um playing with the app dot uh mm -hmm. and it's all it all seems pretty intuitive one of the things that i've got hooked up just for fun into my onsip account and mm -hmm. and uh, by the way echoing randy's sentiment uh our, our account with you guys predates onsip as a brand right, <laughs> uh, right. um and um, we were just using you for asterisk termination in the early days. But yeah. I'm such a bad asterisk admin, and you guys were so reliable that I got rid of the asterisk and just put it <laughs> forward. Um, but I have some surveillance cameras hooked up to you. Um, we don't have a lot of them. Um, because sort of keep a, a look on one side of the – they're SIP-capable surveillance cameras, but they do H.264. I thought, is all the browser-based stuff, is that all VP8? based or is there any facility to handle H.264? That's a really good question. On well, the answer the browser, is an edge case. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. And, and the, the interesting thing is we uh, just recently, and, and it's continuing this week, we're, we're switching all of our um, media over to something called uh, the RTP engine. Uh, so it used to be an RTP proxy, and everything would get kind of proxied together, but we're switching everything over to an RTP engine. One of the, the benefits of that is that it immediately gave us the ability to call from a Bria video phone into the uh, OnSIP app. So I'm just trying to remember the video protocol I was, because I, I actually did it myself. So what... What video protocols does the Bria app support? Hang on, um, we can set up. We 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 can do yeah. that. Um, so my my guess is with our new uh, RT switch over to the RTP engine um, that it would it would just work, but um, and that's in progress. You say uh that is is done for calling what's in progress now is different apps um switching the rtp engine on for uh uh things like a, we have an app called the inbound bridge uh nine one um things like that so we're so using the gp proxy and we're we're slowly switching everything over to the rtp bridge or to, to RTP engine. All right, let's see. Codex. I'm not seeing it at the moment, but I could have something uh, askew at, at my end as well. Um, I just think one of the things that's been really handy just on the pure SIP side is uh, if you have you know, BBX phones or, or Grandstream GXVs, the ability to have yeah. dial something and have the, the camera view come up. It's great if you're answering the door remotely, right? Which is awesome. Right. Right, you guys are exactly. You're, you're transparent to it, but you're at the center of it, so it's wonderful. Um, yeah, Slack. Um, Slack's Slack's interesting. Um, Slack themselves do some WebRTC based stuff. Does that come into play at all? 
Yeah, so within the Slack app, uh, you can you can place a phone call um, between between users, which is uh, which is kind of cool. Um, the um, and they have a, a handful. I, I'd say four, maybe five voice partners. So that's that's kind of next on our list is to be one of the one of the voice partners for Slack. Now you you don't need that within the app. Obviously, it's it's got the uh, phone built in, but so it's kind of taking that phone and putting it over inside the Slack app as well. So you'd have a kind of phone capable and capabilities in, in both. But one of our uh, one of our Slack our uh, Slack app the the slash onsip um, command. One of the commands is to um, uh, set up a call string, and then you can send that call string either as a Slack or wherever you click on that. You I could I could send it to you. You could click on it in any Firefox or Chrome browser. And you'd uh, you'd be calling me on either my um, on whichever phone I'm on, whether I'm on the uh, Onsip app or at my uh, Polycom desk phone. So we kind of integrated it on the calling side with a link, but I'd like it to the the next goal is to uh, actually have a, a link up in that uh, phone icon. Very cool. Are there any particular success stories in in the the browser based adoption? Are there any you know? Customers you can point to who have, I'm thinking that this is sort of like a natural thing for uh, smaller call centers, distributed call centers, this kind of stuff. But yeah, um, I, I I know at the at the end of the la end of the year last year there was a uh, public uh, television station in Detroit that set up a whole temporary call center using just browsers. So they had um, they had a bunch of laptops. Uh, what they didn't have were a bunch of Polycom, Grandstream phones sitting around. They did have laptops and internet connections. So with that, they were able to bring in a whole bunch of volunteers, set up a temporary call center uh, with just the, the web browser with the Onsip app and set up, have their, have their call in uh, marathon, and then tear it all down, uh, log everybody out. So, uh, that's pretty cool. We in our press release we had a couple different uh, companies that uh, talked about sh you know being already using the Onsip app for internal communications and and liking the ability to add uh, to not have to switch windows. So they're in the Onsip app and that's handling. So getting closer and closer to real unified communications. So in the Onsip app, making and receiving phone calls and. Uh, getting their Slack communications uh, all in the same window. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, press releases. Gee, those are nice. I um, <laughs> pay attention to them, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, While you know, you're reading that, Michael, uh, if you jump in for a second, I just wanted to um, mention to Mike that it's not apparently obvious to people maybe who are listening to what we're talking about now uh, what we do with, with OnSIP. And there are many things you can do just with the, the thing that has existed for several years. And one of them is we have a DID from Voxbone that is, has a bunch of worldwide call-ins. And on the admin console, uh, I can route those to different ZipDX. I guess I can route them anywhere. But more importantly, there's all kinds of applications that work with this. And um, one of them is uh, uh, time of day, open hours. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. the name of it, but that, that's what it does. Yeah. This is our so, rules, yeah. Right, so you can do that. You can. Um, I'm now. I hope I'm not going on the ledge here, but I think you can do the um, uh, what's it called uh, round robin, which is to ring different numbers one after the other, and so on. So there's all of that too. I mean, we're not just talking about the latest and greatest WebRTC stuff here. There's also right. all of the basic functionality, and we use it here at the VC. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it kind of goes along with the with the company name with with Onsep. Every part of uh, your onset PBX has a SIP address, so that's that's every user, every phone number, every voicemail box, uh, and then so if you take a, a service like Voxbone, which is also very SIP aware, you can take a Voxbone phone number and point it directly into Onsip and and hit your internal PBX wherever you want because every piece has its own SIP address. So it's right. a, yeah, the the integration at that SIP level is kind of nice. 
And I, although I mentioned Voxbone because they work with us, uh, obviously ONSIP has plenty of DIDs if you want one or more. Well, well the Voxbone yeah. is great. We use them ourselves for international. Yeah. Yeah, they're a great international inbound carrier. Yeah, not only that, but uh, you know anybody who's anybody who's on ONSIP, who's who's connected to ONSIP, uh, can in fact go zip into ZipDX and and do HD voice, which is a, sort of one of our hallmarks. So yep. it's been it's been quite good, and and WebRTC just sort of extends all of that. Um, a, another question, sort of taking things to the side, um, you reintroduced. Uh, well, there's been a sort of maybe I need some explaining. Uh, there was get on SIP, which is sort of a free SIP uh, mm -hmm. WebRTC based thing, um, right? That uh, that's been around for a while, but you you reintroduced just recently this this free tier for on net calls. Um, what what right. what motivates that? Yeah, um, it's it, it's really kind of two things. One uh, and and with with get on SIP as as well, uh, we, we wanted to give back to the community. Uh, you know, like I said, we're we use a lot of open source. We give back to the open source community. Uh, we 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 helped Google in in Android with with part of their, I and mean, that's that's more of a badge of honor that that we found an issue in SIP. We gave it to Android and Google, and they actually said, "Oh yeah, that's a real issue. Thanks for the fix." So that was cool. But um, free switch and and others where we we constantly give uh, if if we you know services that, that we use software um, uh, open source software that we use if we find something it's an enhancement we, we give back to that community and so get on sip was uh, was definitely a, a, a part of the motivation was to, to to give back and and you know just promote sip in general and give out free sip addresses uh, the other side of it was uh, uh, great load testing. Uh, we can, to, to us, get on SIP looks like one ginormous uh, PBX. So to us, it looks like one PBX with over 100,000 subscribers in it and you know thousands to, to multiple thousands uh, simultaneously registered users. So it's a, it's a really great proof of concept that the system that we have can scale pretty much infinitely, um, both on just records in the database and simultaneous users. So, uh, it, it, you know, as a, as a development platform, it was, it was useful to us. Um, and so what we wanted to do was just I increase that, that usefulness. So you can get a free SIP address. Everyone's address is, is at, uh, so username at uh, getonsip.com. Um, but it's kind of kind of one at a time. There's no user management, and we were seeing companies come in and, and register, boom, 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 a, a bunch of users all at the same time. So they're they're clearly trying to do some internal SIP communications. Well, let's you know let, let's let's make this easier for them, uh, and let's give them a path to go from a, a free product and, and use that by all means. But if you want to take that and, and roll it out and have it become your whole phone system, uh, give them an easier path to, to do that. And so that's our new freemium product. Uh, the, the big thing, so it's still free SIP addresses, um, still free for free forever. Uh, the, the big change is you now have uh, user management. So you can go in and create your own domain, uh, acme.onsip.com, or you even have the ability to use your own Domain. Uh, so if you have acme.com, your SIP address can be mike at acme.com as well. Um, simple SRV record and and put that in the interface. But it gives you user uh, user management. So you can go in and put in all your users, give them extensions. Everyone gets a SIP address, obviously, but you can give them a, uh, you can layer extensions as an alias on top of the SIP address uh, to make things even easier. Uh, so that was the kind of the, the goal behind the freemium product is to take what is a single uh, single SIP address and turn it into a way for a whole organization to come in and, and have free calling. And and they all get access to the ONSIP app. So not only do you get web-based calling and, and free calling, but the, you get the status and you get chat and you get the Slack integration. You know, this is really, it's really cool because what you get in the free tier is... Well, there are a lot of 
substantial business is paying a lot of money to have that <laughs> just in general. And, and yeah. then, you know, because you do have to interact with the rest of the world to a degree, uh, you know, that's where, okay, there's a revenue stream for you guys in that gatewaying function. And, but right. the core of what you do, the, the, the stuff that, as you say, that stays on net on SIP is, um, is really compelling. Uh, yeah. and then Slack integration on top of it. Oh, oh, there's someone, something coming up in IS, IRC. Yeah, it's um, and be because we wrote our own software, we don't have license uh, agreements to anybody else, so we can offer seats for for free, which is kind of a game changer. So really, bringing you know uh, uh, unified communications and and uh, uh, you know unified communications as a service, and really bringing it into the the cloud era, getting it out of the old telco era. There's no there's no X soft license involved. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Nope. I don't know if you saw Michael. Uh, James just said something in IRC that uh, there was some discussion at Astracon regarding Jeff Pulver uh, restarting free world dial up service. Michael, if you probably remember that, I I would guess. Oh, I do. Been yeah. Been around <laughs> since then. And uh, James said, but actually. Uh, and this is true. Onsip basically replicates that functionality with a lot more added on. So that's true yeah. with the free account. I wonder yeah. how many users Onsip has relative to Freewheel Dialup in its heyday. I mean, my number was five four two four five, which wasn't extremely low, but it was low. I think I even had another digit. No, there were a lot of there were a lot of experimenters on, but those were the crazy, wild and crazy days too. You remember that. That was a big deal. Asterisk was a big deal, and uh, free will dial-up was a big deal. Zoom forward to uh, what, 15 years later, 12, 15 years later. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's 10, maybe 20 different services that are doing that. Google, you know, Grand Central and Google Voice came into yep. that. I mean, everybody's got something out there. Uh, interestingly enough, a junction which became Onsip has been here all this time. I, I'm trying to think of somebody else who has. <laughs> remember uh, VoIP Jet? Remember, uh, there's a bunch of other names that have disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. We're coming up on half a million users. Wow. Yeah. Free will dial up peaked at about 150,000, 160,000. But it was the very first service um, that managed to scale asterisk big by using right. SIP Express Router to, to front-end a, a, a matrix of different um, asterisk boxes underneath. Because uh, before then, um, we used to hit the, uh, the dreaded asterisk wall, didn't we? Right. It was between, what, 250, 350 uh, concurrent users, the whole thing. But of the 150,000 users of free world dial-up, 149,500 of them were hams. Uh, Michael Graves is the only one who was didn't have a license. I think. I got to tell you, I, I I wonder for all the users, I wonder how many concurrent calls they actually had up. You know, that would be an interesting thing. You guys mm -hmm. at Onset, you you have, I bet you have significant traffic at any given moment in time, whereas I think yeah. they were probably spotty. So, well, yeah. do you remember when when Jeff Pulver announced that they were offering free PSTN calls? For Christmas, and, uh, and, and the whole whole FWD network just went into total meltdown because uh, I think half of Israel was trying to call the U.S. using <laughs> uh, using free world dial up, and uh, they only had one T one on the back end of it, and that <laughs> uh, limited the yeah back when, the, uh, back the when free calls mattered. So so I'm I'm. Um, gathering from that, uh, Mike, that you're using Kamaelio on the on the back end, or possibly SIP Express Router. Have I misunderstood that? Oh, uh, we have um, on our back end. Uh, open Open SIPs. Okay. Majority of the routing. Uh, we have a couple different databases. We have a, a MySQL database, and that's for m oh, data that's a little bit more static. Uh, like registrations that hang around for a little bit longer, uh, and then we use a, a Cassandra database. So that's the uh, Amazon database that does a really good job of uh, recovery. Um, that uh, gets the the thing with Cassandra is that it tries to be 
mostly right most of the time, which is a complete anathema for for databases. Um, but for 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 example, uh, you know, we've got a New York data center and an LA data center. And you know, exchanging all the data. For the most part, the New York data center can operate completely by itself. Most of the, if you're connected to New York, you're going to be making your calls in and out of New York, and you're going to be calling other extensions that are in New York. But you, you, there are times when you know half of your company's in New York, half of your company's in LA. We do GeoDNS routing, so you connect to the data center that's closest to you, regardless of what domain you're in. Uh, so extension 7001 could be connected to the LA data center, extension 7002 could be connected to the New York data center, and you need to call each other. And that's where Cassandra comes into play, so that the both data centers know uh, where everybody is at, at all times. Um, but it's not, it's not, it, it's one of those things where it just needs to be mostly right most of the time, and Cassandra is really, really, really good at uh, doing tons and tons of transactions. So it came from the um, Amazon shopping cart. Uh, you know, in the middle of a shopping session, somebody crashes their browser, goes from one, uh, you know, one ISP to another ISP or whatever. Um, it, when they come back on, maybe that last thing that they put in their shopping cart isn't there, but everything else is. So the shopping cart is mostly right most of the time, and uh, keeps the keeps the person shopping instead of that whole database record going going out the window. So it, it's 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 interesting. It's it's amazing, and our engineering team can talk about it a lot a lot more and a lot better than I can, but it's it's really interesting to see them use kind of the, the, the right tool at the right place for the right job. So the MySQL for stuff that's got to be 100% right all the time um, and, and in sync everywhere, and then Cassandra when you've got a little bit more, uh, a little bit more leeway, a little bit more flexibility in it, so. Yeah, no, no, I, I mean, it was just uh, James mentioning asterisk and, and stuff reminded me that, that you probably yeah. weren't using that and hadn't been using it for quite a while, I would have thought. We do, actually. We do. Okay. You know where it is uh, on uh, carrier gateways. It, it just, it, it worked when you have to, when you don't have to do anything too crazy and you've got a, a limited number of, we know exactly how many, on this pipe, we have uh, so many connections, so many simultaneous connections to uh, level three. That's fantastic. And so uh, OpenSIPs can, can send those calls out to, uh, uh, out to those edge, uh, edge asterisk boxes. And DTM, you, you need the call to set up, tear down, and do DTMF. Asterisk, perfect. Right. Um, and just total workhorse. And I, uh, I haven't checked in a long time, but we are we're on the we're not much further past the version of asterisk than than the one that we had in 2005 2006 yeah 1.4 i bet I bet you any yeah. Still on one yeah. yeah yeah ain't broke don't fix it so so that that brings me to another yeah. question which is it, how do you how do you cope with the the audio codecs? Um, if you're doing webrtc calls amongst themselves then obviously they do they end up doing Doing Opus, but um, when you bridge out to the PSTN, what are you what are you using there? And how far back up the tree to the browser do you do you push it? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point, um, and because that's another thing that asterisk uh, can can really start to slow asterisk down if you have to do do the transcoding, uh, and we and we don't. So the asterisk because they talk to. Um, uh, because they only talk to the carriers, and the carriers only do um, G711, then that makes it that makes it easier. So we need to so just in front of those boxes, if it's something other than um, than U law or A law, we we transcode it there. Um, for everything else, for the most part, we're we are codec agnostic, uh, and we let the two endpoints. Uh, establish that call. So if the two endpoints, um, they, they can they can even talk in a uh, completely proprietary protocol as long as the two endpoints support it. So if you want to do screen sharing over ONSIP, great, that'll work. Um, do you not have to proxy that media though for other reasons that means you need to understand the codec? Nope, only if it goes out to the PSTN. If it's if it stays on net anywhere. 
uh, the, the two endpoints uh, negotiate uh, codec themselves. And on top of that, if the two endpoints are behind the same network on the same LAN, we will tell that we will we will see that in real time and we will tell the box at, or the phone at 192.168.1.105 to send its media directly to 1.107 and vice versa. It doesn't mm -hmm. come all the way up to ONSIP and then back down to the other phone. So media will stay on the uh, on a local area network. I don't know if everyone does that, but not many people do. I have enjoyed slash suffered that from from the standpoint of, of um, I, I, I try a lot of IP phones. And uh, there are some that just don't anticipate that. They expect that the media is going to be proxied and their NAT traversal solutions are not sufficiently robust to uh, right. uh, point, point to point um, in that fashion. And oftentimes you lose media. And, and I know ONSIP has been wonderful in the last few years as I've been testing various different Opus capable bits of hardware and software that, um, yeah. and in fact, um, yeah, there's just some interesting stuff happening. Um, somebody, I won't name names, but somebody announced an Opus capable ATA this week. Ooh. Um, which is kind of really, yes. We well, talk why can't, why can't you mention names? Um, well, because. I'm trying to understand whether this is an actual piece of technology or just a piece of errant architecture. So, so I've been thinking about this because you mentioned it uh, on the chat a while back, and and I was thinking, why would you do that? And and obviously you were thinking the same thing. Um, and the only thing I can come up with is it basically it saves people transcoding in the middle. Right. right. So it does, it does that transcode free thing that's been a topic of conversation all along this sort of past HD voice and IPX and all of that, right? Yeah, but it's more to it than that because you, you then benefit from the, the very robust nature of the OPIS codec. So, I mean, you saw the demonstration last year, Tim, where we were operating at 45% packet loss with, uh, with OPIS, and it was still fine. And you certainly can't do that with any other uh, codec that's widely available. That's presumably implementation, though. And, and that if it's just architecture, then the implementation may not be that robust. Yeah. And why can't you tell us who it is? is it because I'm waiting for them. To, I'm waiting for them. They, I, I, I posed them some questions. They're friends. I posed them some questions. They went off. To, they gave me an initial set of responses that were not satisfactory. They went off to cogitate about it for a while and asked their bigger brains. And I'm giving them the opportunity to come back and sort themselves out before we, we start uh, poking fun at them. Because well, that, like, that sounds, sounds horribly corporate. Like, yeah, well, <laughs> there, there's, there's no point in slinging Small mud in, corporate. until there's a reason. Some, sometimes that's, people... That's just, yeah, so uh, in any event, um, to bring this back to ONSIP, we like Opus, and ONSIP does Opus, yeah. and we like Wideband, and ONSIP does Wideband, and these are wonderful things. And just as easily as that PBS station put up a pop-up call center using just browsers, they could have done that click-to-call on their website and bring you know, customers in to talk about, or their audience members in to talk about things that were going on in programming or whatnot. And they could have done it with all of the quality of an FM radio station for very little money. And, and that's just awesome that you guys are able to. Yeah. Uh, Except, Michael, that the problem tends to be the problem that people don't have decent microphones. So from the moment you go up to something as good as Opus, you start hearing the imperfections of oh, Lord, they've got a bad microphone there. Whereas, you know, the kind of um, GSM quality calls kind of tend to lose the, that level of detail, so you can't tell anymore. GSM well, being the best friend to VoIP. <laughs> GSM? It lowered, it lowered the, the standard. These days, most of the mobile network operators they just totally work with AMR Wi-Fi. So the quality um, on, on mobile now, uh, if you're running Volti or anything like that, is actually extremely good. And it's one of, um, uh, and most of the mobile network operators now are interworking, do, running the interconnections, um, exchanging traffic with um, AMR, in AMR wideband. So nobody wants to drop down to crappy old um, narrow band G711, um, which is it's just ridiculous, really. It's in this country, there's no peering over wideband. Uh, there is. Oh, there is, he said, um, producing a, a phone 
So well, I can demonstrate it. Should we do things with demo? But but not now because it's Mike's Mike's show. Oh, right. who is question, doing question, it in the United? Question, who is doing question, that in the United you, States? Do you guys do any IP based peering, Mike, or is it all TDM? <sighs> we uh, early, early, early on, um, and John spent. Uh, John Reardon, our, our, our CTO, spent so much time uh, doing least cost routing and going out and, and looking to see if a phone number was uh, was able to be connected via IP. I forget, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of that. Um, there were a couple different databases that you could hit. Um, but we, we want uh, three or four second call setup times and we were taking, spending so much time going out looking to see if these phone numbers were, were SIP capable um, that when they would inevitably fail and not be SIP capable that we'd then send it over to the PSTN and still have three or four seconds. So uh, unfortunately we ended up uh, abandoning that. Um, but if it's if it's a true SIP address like the uh, like a SIP address for the um, uh, for a conference bridge or something like that, then then yeah, well that's basically IP peering. You can you can uh, both in and out of on SIP. You can call SIP addresses out. You can receive SIP addresses in. Uh, so total peering in in that sense. But no, if you if you call a phone number, that's going out. It's going to hit an asterisk box, and it's going to go out to not, you know, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the fact that you know the major mobile carriers are all doing wideband on their networks. But they're not peering. They're not allowing you to hit those networks no. uh, by a PSTN gateway. So, no. all right, go ahead, James. In, 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 make me smart. Enlighten us. Uh, with what? <laughs> well, you're going to tell us. You're going to tell us how we how we're going to be able to do that 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 uh, wideband between mobile carriers. Yeah, I was asking them which carriers would support it. Actually, James, in the United um, States, well, actually, AT and T does it, and T Mobile. Those are the two that I know about. So you you place a call from T Mobile to AT and T, you'll get a wideband call. Depends where you are and and what radio access you're on. But if it's Volte at both ends, the answer is yes. Or Volte wow. or 3G. Wow. So yes. How exciting. I'll have to try that at some point. That, that must be brand new because we were talking to T-Mobile about getting traffic from them over IP. Yeah, but uh, who were you talking to at T-Mobile? Because there, there are lots of people to talk to at T-Mobile. And, uh, uh, and if you talk to um, the standard interface person, you'll get the standard answer which is the, the standard interface is g711 narrow band eight kilohertz no we were, we're talk, we were not we we're not going in through that side of the company we we're going in through through business services and a marketing the marketing arm of the company so and I, there there was interest but there was no action so so our, our experience i mean i'm sure that this is everybody else's experience is that the internal div, uh, organizations within a carrier are the people who are least able to access any services within that carrier um, you know they 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 are they're, they're somehow the business units are, are the ones that are, are, have got the least chops at actually getting at the product um, in a way that somehow I don't know there's some sort of um, suicidal instinct in carriers where they they really don't want to allow the good stuff out and certainly not make a profit with it yeah, you're right. It's all about control, isn't it? All yeah, right, exactly. Well, that's that's probably it, actually. Yeah. You know, I, I have to circle back to our guest here and say that we're talking to a CEO who is sort of uniquely capable to talk tech talk at, at these levels, which I think is is uh, kind of incredible and commendable. And um, and and the challenge is you know, clearly there are a bunch of us who would like to enjoy the kinds of things you offer, but we'd like to enjoy it extended out to our mobile phones and such like, which just plots a you know profitable future for you. So yeah. Yeah, I mean yeah. I think I think think I'd I would like to kind of tip my hat to the fact that you guys have carried on doing something worthwhile and valuable and doing it well. Um, whilst like everybody else has been swerving around doing crazy stuff and going broke or raising billions, uh, depending on who you talk to. And and right. and you guys have just kind of soldiered along doing Good, reliable stuff, and making incremental improvements, and then bigger improvements you know, yeah. as and when. But I mean, I'm trying to think. The first time I used your service must be. I was back here, so I guess '97, probably. Is that be right? 
That was no. Josh. Uh, hey, so it, it, yeah, so we started trunking in 04. So uh, mm-hmm. in 97, I was, John, John Reardon and I were working for the, the second ISP in Manhattan for, um, uh, and, and that was Interport. Uh, so Panix was number one, and then Interport was number two. And then we ended up selling Interport to RCN, the cable company, out of uh, Princeton. Uh, we sold that in around 99 and then did a couple of various things and then um, started Junction Networks with SIP trunking in 04 and then launched on SIP as a hosted PBX product in October of 06. More or less. So check the math. Tim. I'm going to have to do, do it, yes. I'm going to have to A, check the math, and B, check my email to work out where, when, <laughs> when this was. I'll, I'll be back when I've done that. All right. If so it was an e- early on, if it was an email to tech support, it was probably answered by me. So <laughs> I was doing sales and tech support. Well, that's because you have to let the engineering guys do the engineering, which is a 24-hour task. <laughs> Somebody's got to write. The code's not going to write itself. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So um, going forward, you, you're, um, you're retiring the old MyOnSip. App.onSip yep. is, is the, the new hotness, to borrow a term. Uh, and um, is there, a, is there a, a path for this going forward? Do you have some, some hints at what, what might extend what's there? I mean, clearly Slack is, is a, an integration path, and Slack opens other opportunities, I suppose. Um, right. But, I don't know, got an imagination, an imaginative take on what might be? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got my own wish list. Uh, whether engineering decides to listen to that, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, a whole other, that's a whole other question. Um, a, a little say in, in what we do, but, uh, but not a lot. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's. You're right, and especially with with WebRTC and a, and a web-based app and these integrations. The the thing I'm most excited about is actually the the fact that all of this is written on top of the the SIP.js uh, JavaScript stack and our own APIs. Um, so the parts that I'm I'm most excited about is what some of our customers are are doing with those, and those are the you know, so it's 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 nice and it's fun and it's interesting to see what what you know what we're doing and, and moving forward with. But I I'm really interested in uh, watching what some of our customers do with these interfaces. Um, uh, one of our, our big ones is a company called Live Ninja, and they do uh, they've done a WebRTC integration for retail. And uh, they put kiosks in retail locations. You know, retail locations where you'll have the the Verizon kiosk, and you'll have the Verizon expert in in some big, big large box uh, electronics store. Um, so instead of having a rep at every one of the stores, you'll have a kiosk, and you'll have a couple reps that are connected uh, via WebRTC and VoIP. Uh, to a kind of a, a call center location, and you you walk over, you have some questions about uh, the Verizon uh, display there. You can talk to that uh, specialist over over video right there. Um, it's kind of the Amazon Fire tablet kind of approach to things, isn't it? it it's sort of like, yeah, it is exactly that. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Is, uh, which uh, is exciting. There's some some very uh, so. Who haven't launched yet, but are, are doing some cool in in game uh, uh, voice video interactions, uh, both with other people and with the game itself. Um, those are those are fun. You know, those are the types of things that we would never, you know, go and and develop ourselves and and get into. But it's a uh, it's interesting that they're putting that on top of our. So so, so the the answer was it was two thousand and eight. I was out by a decade. <laughs> Which, okay. So here's a, a, a sort of a secondary or tertiary question. Some of this is not selling your service. Some of this is selling APIs, and it's selling to a different audience. I think yeah. one of the earlier visits, you were just sort of about to hit 
hit the road some of your people and do some trade shows and promote APIs as opposed to hosted PBX. Had there been any significant lessons down that path? I mean, it's a different market entirely, right? I mean, what's yeah. what's the takeaway from, because you've been successful clearly, uh, at least to a degree, uh, any memorable right. things? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's really, <laughs> yeah, the lesson is it's really hard. Um, yeah, because you're right, because we're, we're selling to small and medium businesses, we're, we're selling a real-time communication. Uh, you know, a voice video, voicemail, um, ACD cues, conference uh, conference suites. You know, the the that whole you know, throw out your old phone system and, and bring in OnSip, um, and that's on one side. And then on the other side, we've got these really amazing developers doing really amazing things. Uh, but it's a whole different billing infrastructure. It's a whole different support infrastructure. It's a whole different provisioning infrastructure. Uh, that's it's a lot of work. Um, it's it's amazing what John again John Reardon has done. Every uh, you know when you look at a lot of service providers, the API is kind of a bolt on on the side. Maybe you can do some bulk, uh, maybe add users or 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 something, some sort of bulk functionality with the API. But for John, he mandated that everything that we do, everything that you see in the in the admin portal, everything in the uh, uh, OnSIP app is all written on top of our own API. So we treat ourselves as if we are an API customer. Uh, so there's no, you know, there are no shortcuts. Um, and now that helps us in the in the long run. We can swap things out behind the scenes and and don't have to do don't have to touch the interface. But yeah, the initial development, you're developing at the interface layer, you're developing at the whole back end. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the lesson is that we've, we've been able to get some, some API customers and it's great having that functionality, but it's really hard to, uh, it, it be, still being a bootstrap company, which we are, so we've never taken VC funds. Uh, we, you know, we take the money that we get and we put it back into the back into the company, either developers or sales or, or whatnot. Um, and as you know, owners of the company, the best thing we can do is be good investors. So how do we, we take this dollar, the dollar that we earned and, and where do we invest it over here? Uh, uh, it, it's been it, it's been tough to really break into that API market in a Twilio Tropo kind of way. Um, so that's 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 probably our biggest takeaway. Yeah, you have. Um, uh, I've been for other reasons thinking about this, and uh, and the the big difference is you have an established. I guess you have an established infrastructure. There's a certain amount of when you talk about APIs, is how much are you rolling your own up against mm -hmm. somebody's API versus how much is the service they're making accessible by their API, a fait accompli that you're just tapping into. And a lot of it, I think, is in the Twilio market space. And, and I may be speaking out of term. Tim and James, feel free to correct me. Um, well, uh, Michael, I don't want to correct you, but I want to point out you've gone all Cylon. Oh, I have? Oh, I'm so glad that's not on my end, because I have a question. I registered it on IRC a couple of minutes ago. Mike, do you oh, wanna, did you hear that well enough to answer it? Uh, to um, to hear Michael's yeah, question? Yeah, did you hear his question? Uh, a little I, I, packet wise. I think the answer is no. <laughs> okay, Mike, uh, I'll ask my question when Michael comes back. Okay. All these microphone, sure. Mike, Michael, and he's back. Uh, Michael, uh, you want to re-ask your question or I have a question as well? I can ask it after you. Go ahead and repeat it, Michael. Well, I think I think the um, the thing that was was occurring to me is is that um, developers who are looking at using leveraging some service, whether it's a Twilio or a 2600 Hertz or whomever, right? I mean, right. to what degree are you accessing a tool set uh -huh. versus accessing a finished service? That that is, you know, you do this call setup. You you don't have to you don't have to use an It's kind of like, am I? This is a library, but how much do I have to DIY even though I'm using that library, right? And and exactly. I think in the API world, there's a sort of a. It's not clear to people what they take on board as their responsibility versus what the service mm -hmm. provides. So right. 
right. been thinking about this a lot, but I'm not a developer. That's why I'm open to being corrected. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because we, we actually have really three different APIs. So one is SIP.js. And you can use that completely independently of OnSIP. Uh, Ring Central. Ring Central uses SIPJS as their WebRTC platform, and all the the service provider behind that is Ring Central. Fantastic, love it. Um, so that's an you know that's an API with with calls with with no service attached to it at all. And then we have our our uh, call setup and teardown. API that uh, is native and, and part of our system. And then we've got our admin API. And so the admin API allows you to create users and, and name them and give them an extension. All the things that you would do through the admin portal, uh, you can do through our admin API. And that's directly connected to our service. And I would say that's more like what talking about it's a it's a finished service you're using the API to more automate things that are that are already done as opposed to modify things that are done the call setup and teardown API is really more of a uh, you're you're trying to build something there so you've got a database and you you want out of this database for calls to go and get set up and sent down to this SIP address over there and then tear down that call and put the entry into the database that that call happened and how long that call was and and so forth and we use that API for our Salesforce integration to do exactly that set up a call find that uh, find the record of that user put the action in that a call happened uh, at the end of the call, put the duration of the call into that record, uh, and then tear down the call at the end. Um, and then versus our SIP.js, which which has no real connection to us at all. So, uh, yeah. So we, you know, uh, we we spend a lot of time thinking about I exactly that as well, and and how people interact with an API and what they're what they're hoping to do with it, what they do with it. Uh, yeah, things like that. So it, it's a very, very interesting, you know, interact with a, with something that already exists, or if you are, you know, trying to, you know, trying to build something all together. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's cool. All right, I am. Uh, I'm going to leave a leave a gap here for. Uh... <laughs> I have a question. Hello. Oh, oh. Uh... All kidding aside, we are up against the hour, and before we give any contact information or any, any of those things, um, Mike Oath, I have to say the full name, so there's cut the confusion. Uh, you've been around for a long time, as have many of us. So you've been through the iterations of the uh, Grand Stream Cheapo 101 and all that. You've seen all these devices. You've seen all the SIP phones. Now we're looking at WebRTC clients and APIs. The question you may not have expected is uh -oh. whenever I'm anywhere, I look at my watch because I get an SMS from my wife and people go, oh, you have a connected watch? You have an Apple watch? I go, well, first of all, it's not an Apple watch because I am not going to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on that. But they're all intrigued by it. And the relationship to my question is we've seen all these different devices and now even I, who am very skeptical of these wearables, uh, I'm actually getting a lot of benefit out of it. And I was wondering if you either within the, the on-sip vision or even in your own personal vision, uh, what yeah. you see for what we have now and what, right. what is coming. I mean, are there going to be like medical applications where on-sip will be involved or just uh, me talking to my wife and we both have the on-sip service, which I actually do have both free and paid. Uh, what... Right. What do you see with the future of devices and onsip? If yeah. it, if there's if that's a fair question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, I I I love the kind of future looking looking forward questions. Uh, we we have an ambulance company right now that uh, has a WebRTC connection to the ER. So when they're they are in the ambulance, they can see real time video the ER doc can stand there and she can see into the ambulance uh, and, and see real-time video as they're approaching the, uh, the hospital. So uh, we're, so there, there are these applications today and people are, are already seeing that and, and making that happen. Um, 
it's it, it's it's super interesting. Uh, me personally, I just ordered the new uh, Fitbit HR2. Um, I have the it's charging where here it is. So I've got the I've got the Fitbit one, but I also wear analog. Um, have uh, I have an Apple Watch, and I just wasn't getting the utility out of it. I was charging it every day, and I'm like, you know, I just for the most part, I just want to see what time it is. And so I've I've kind of gone back to an analog watch. Um, but the for the Fitbit, um, I, I I like the fitness, uh, the the steps and and the calories. Um, there you go. But yeah, what I really James, love. James is showing the Fitbit that I sent him because I got tired uh, of it. Uh, I actually, just to make sure that everybody understands, I never would have bought this watch. It's an Android watch. It's one of the early ones. I won it in a contest. But it is useful for these few things. And yeah. uh, Mike, what you said about the ambulance, that's interesting uh, because I can just picture the, uh, not that arm, put the needle in the other, or too high. <laughs> I don't know. No, that's, that's a beautiful example, though, of, of, of usability of, uh, of a technology. And what we need to do is is get good uses like that of these technologies and stop worrying about posting on social media as the only, you know, that's the big thing that we're doing with technology. And WebRDC, right. I, I saw while I was in the States, I haven't seen this much in Europe, but in the States I was surprised to see a lot of people using either FaceTime or something like it on their phones. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was in a doctor's office in a waiting room that had a windows and when the person went out to make a call and I could clearly see she was talking to somebody on a uh, video call, which was just yeah. a friend, obviously. So it wasn't some, yeah. you know, conference. Anyway, these things are, are moving right along, and, and you folks are following the technology, and I think that's fantastic. Let me do one last thing, because we're, as I said, we're getting to the hour here, and that is, Mike, um, how, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you as far as either for feedback, research yeah. with you, you know, cont contribution, any of that thing, right. any of those things? Great. Two, the, the two best ways, one, uh, a direct email, and it's K-E, Mike at onsip, O-N-S-I-P dot com. That's easy. And then uh, Twitter, VoIP CEO, V-O-I-P CEO. I got, a, I got a good one. I got, I got that I, one early. I love that you got that. I didn't know you had that. I was just saying on Twitter, yeah. I said, look at this guy. Here he is. He's got that. <laughs> He's got the handle. All right, Michael. Thank you, and you're gonna. You need to send John over one of these days, also to do a, a, heap, a hyper geeky session uh, when, yeah. when that's called for, because he's done a couple of those for us, and Absolutely. they've been great too. Oh, great! Well, thank you so much. It's been a thanks, pleasure, thanks, Mike, and thanks for your support over the years. We love OnSIP, we love Junction, and um, uh, Michael. Anything else from anybody? No, I think the fan club has exercised their uh, their. Uh, cheerleader moment there you today. go but uh, <laughs> it's from here all right folks thanks to everybody who participates in these calls as you know we're at vuc.me and right now we're going to be over to the mature audiences only goodbye